A very warm welcome to everyone who's joining from around the world for our World Consumer Rights Day 2021 Leadership Perspectives webinar. As I'm sure you all know, World Consumer Rights Day takes place on March the 15th every year. It is a day when we celebrate consumer protection, the fact that we are all consumers. Uh, that means we are all actors in the marketplace and we have rights, we have consumer rights, um, and the, those are enshrined, in fact, at the United Nations in the guidelines on consumer protection. Um, every single year, Consumers International has the privilege and pleasure of coordinating World Consumer Rights Day, and we work with our network of consumer advocates in 100 countries around the world. Each year, we pick a theme, uh, with our members. And it was fantastic to see that this year, uh, the choice was to focus on tackling plastic pollution. Now that choice came about for too many reasons, um, but two in particular. First, um, there is a very clear recognition that tackling plastic pollution is a global consumer issue of global consumer concern. We have spent some time this year focusing in just a tiny part of that problem with a report uh, written in conjunction with UNEP and where we co-lead the, the consumer information program. That report was called, Can I Recycle This? Uh, the answer to that question is maybe. Uh, consumer packaging and packaging around plastics is confusing, it's misleading, and it's part of the problem. It's part of the, the systemic problem we face. The other reason for choosing tackling plastic pollution um, is also personal. Uh, our council was elected in 2019. On that council, Rosemary Siachitema was the executive director of consume, the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. We asked all of our council members to come to the first council meeting with a video showing the reality for consumers in their country. Rosemary brought a video of mountains of plastic in her country, mountains of plastic waste, and highlighted for the whole council the importance of focusing on that issue. It's my great pleasure today to bring together a group of leaders who can help us kick start our conversation about tackling plastic pollution and how consumers and consumer advocacy can make a difference. We will use this webinar to learn it's a safe space for all of us to ask questions and to see what can be done better and what can be done together. Let me share with you who our panelists are today. Next slide. We have on the panel a fantastic mix of expertise from consumer advocacy, from the world of business, from civil society, from expert, expert backgrounds. We have Jennifer Morgan, who is the director, executive director of Greenpeace International. Seema Shandil, the CEO of the Consumer Council of Fiji. Elizabeth Iberico, who is joining from Peru, and she is a consumer advocate who sits within our Consumers International Next Generation Network of Youth Voices. Martin Stuktai is the founder and managing partner at Systemic. Will Connolly, Head of Packaging Innovation and Sustainability at The Body Shop. Niall Dunn is the CEO of Polymateria. Anya Philip is the President of the Danish Consumer Council. And Saroja Sundaram is Executive Director at the Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group, Chennai in India. I hope you'll agree with me that we couldn't have a better group to help us think through the many challenges and the way in which we can tackle plastic pollution together. If there's one group missing, it would be government. And I'll be interested to see if we can engage a couple of government voices as we progress towards uh, World Consumer Rights Day on March the 15th. I'm gonna start with Elizabeth and I'm gonna ask her because she is the voice of the next generation, what her hopes are for World Consumer Rights Day and her hopes and why it is so important to tackle plastic pollution. Elizabeth, over to you. 
Many, many, many thanks, Lena, and thanks to all the team of Consumers International. Well, this is a very extensive issue, so I would like to give some ideas and opinions around the subject. In first place, we should notice that the generation of today and tomorrow is really different for many things. And I think that the most important characteristic in this subject is that we were born with the problems of environmental with environmental problems. So that makes us a, a population that is more sensitive and is more aware about these problems. So why it is very difficult to us to apply this to our daily life? I think that all jobs uh, uh, have the intention of two things. The first one is to demand change. We want to we want to uh, see the change today, and the other one is that we uh, we want to we try to apply all of these sustainable consumption to our life. But between the intention and the action, is there is a great a step. So this is uh, impact for many factors, and one of the factors, and I think that is the, mo the most powerful, is the advertising. Advertising that encourage us to consume unnecessarily. And advertising for us is everywhere. It's on, it's on, on TV, it's in the supermarket, it's on, on, our, on, on, our, on the social networks, it's on the cell phone, so it's everywhere. So for that, I think it's really important that, uh, that work together, not only consumers, if not only the government and the private sector. Another obstacle that I see, and especially in Latin America, is that exist many taboos and belief around sustainable consumption. For example, it's really common in Peru, in Chile, in Argentina, to listen when someone talks about sustainable consumption, that this problem is only for the rich sector, or this problem is only, only applies recycled bottle when we know that implies more, for example, the seven error. So that happened a lot between joke and between and in Latin America. So I think that we need many action, but I would like to highlight three that for me would make to involve more young people. The first one is education. I think it's really necessary to introduce a sustainable consumption education since school. The second one is to use technology. I think that uh, all young people are really, uh, for us it's really easy to use technology, for example, apps, it's like a game. So we need, it to, uh, we, we need these kind of tools in order to uh, have more information, in order to compare products, for example, and also to take actions. And the last one is that we should use social networks in order to promote sustainable consumption. For example, Instagram, TikTok, and others. Uh, for us, not, it's not only a social platform, it's also a, a space where we can demand things. So I would like to finalize saying uh, an opinion. I think the young uh, uh, population is uh, there we have a characteristic and we have the characteristic to be impatient we don't want things for tomorrow we want things for today and for example in peru it's really common that the movement is organized for young people and and why because we are really bored really bored to wait to the government to have a result in two years or five years, for example, in Peru, with uh, with politics related with healthy promotion. So we are really worried for that. And for us, it's really easy to use uh, Facebook, to use Twitter, to demand in real time. So I think that this is a, power, a powerful tool and we have to use it and introduce it in the promotion of sustainable consumption. Thanks, Elena. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate that, you know, you're, you're worried um, about the future and how we make these changes now. And I really liked how you talked about a range of solutions. Um, so perhaps if I can come to, to Jennifer at this point, I gave an, an introduction about tackling plastic pollution that just focused on one thing, right? And this is a, I mean, this is a pollution problem. This is a climate problem. This is a health problem. This is a, a jobs problem as well. Um, Perhaps could if you could pick up sort of how would you uh, describe 
the plastic pollution issue right now. And if you could start responding to Elizabeth about her concern, is she right to be concerned? And what can we do about that? Sure thing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Helena. It's wonderful to be here on this panel and um, looking forward to the exchange with, with everyone who's here as well. I mean, I think we're in this also in a quite a unique moment um, because I think the COVID-19 uh, moment and pandemic, it actually provides a whole opportunity to, to reframe consumption overall because um, there's a lot of mindsets that are being shifted um, as we all go through this. Um, and I think also, you know, thinking about how to, to empower um, consumers in all of this. I mean, I think, um, and, I, you know, a lot of attention has been going um, to ending the fossil fuel era quickly and quickly transitioning to green and just economy. And that's right. But I think the topic that you have chosen for this panel about um, ending plastic pollution and giving citizens or consumers the right to choose what they consume is incredibly important. And I guess maybe just a few a few thoughts also in, in thinking about what Elizabeth said. I mean, and, and a focus of where Greenpeace is right now. I think that the sensitive sensibilities are shifting to more sustainable lifestyles. I think we're seeing that in a number of, of polls. Um, and I think that corporations have pivoted also accordingly, um, some in a very meaningful way, but um, too many not. And I think this is something for people to be really aware of in kind of what are the solutions that are out there. I think some do adopt language that suggests that they're kind of pursuing sustainable practices when really it's just business as usual. And I'll speak a little bit about the, the recycling question um, that comes forward on that. I mean, if you look at, um, there's, there's been recent work done by the Break Free from Plastic uh, movement, which is a global movement made up of over 1900 NGOs, including Greenpeace and individuals. And they, for the third year in the row, row, row have found that Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, and Nestle ranked as the world's worst plastic polluters. Um, and so they, they're companies who claim to be addressing the plastic crisis, but they continue to invest in these kind of false solutions. And they, while teaming up also with oil companies, I think that's something that's often not clear to people is the connection between plastic and actually the fossil fuel economy that's, that's out there. Um, and we've heard a little bit, I mean, single use plastics are just have devastating uh, impacts, not only on the planet, but for frontline communities. Uh, waste pickers in the global south are really um, witnessing rapid escalation of low-grade single-use plastic packaging that are being aggressively replaced in the market by major multinational corporations. And so I think, and, and those are the people who corporations uh, rely on to collect their packaging um, that allow them to meet their sustainability commitments and justify such a high use of, of single-use plastic. And I think the key thing, um, you know, one key thing is I think that recycling is really a myth. And I hope, um, I think that might surprise people because I think we've all been trained to recycle. Um, but it's a myth because corporations mostly handle recycling from the downstream up, kind of the other, the wrong way around. And they rely heavily on technological solutions to, that don't yet exist or are fledgling. But sustainability is really about safety, right? I mean, it's about the safety of our planet, of, of the product for those who are consuming it and the workers when it comes to chemical exposure as well as livelihoods. And so I think if you have a situation where companies are, are not fulfilling their responsibility to reduce plastic production or waste, then governments do have to step in and pass laws that properly regulate business practices while banning some plastics like microbeads or, or poly, polystyrene. Um, and maybe just a thought on, we could maybe get into this a little bit in the panel. I mean, I think, you know, in a way it's the entire unsustainable socioeconomic uh, system that needs to be transformed. And we hear a lot about the circular economy and getting attention from governments and corporations kind of as a big fix to our neoliberal economic system. And it certainly does have a chance uh, of changing things, but I think it has to be seen as a whole and not just being picked out in certain pieces of it. Um, and, and I think that's a key piece um, because it's not, um, it's actually, you know, slowing down the consumption and production of materials, resources, energy altogether 
and then implementing long-term waste prevention solutions that would design out the waste. Um, so yeah, I agree with Elizabeth. I mean, each of us has a key role to play in ending the, the addiction to plastic. Um, I think um, while you know, green sustainable brands may be better products, the world's really not in a position to get out of this crisis by continuing to shop as we have been. And so I think uh, along with government policy and regulation, we do have a, a do need to have a strong focus on changing consumption, you know, on media, you know, on social media, as Elizabeth mentioned, you know, from companies, from governments to influencers. I think we need to change our shopping model in a way to trend today, trash tomorrow, to less is better, where less is actually the priority. So thanks. Helena. Thank you very much, Jennifer. If I can move to you, Martin. So I think it was last year you launched a fantastic piece of work with Pew looking at the, the plastic situation and proposing a series of interventions. There was a, a terrifying thing, which you might correct me on. I think it was everything that we are currently doing, all of the commitments will probably reduce the level, the, the extent of plastics into uh, by about 7%. Um, correct me on that figure, but it stuck with me um, and gives us a spur to do so much more. Could you share a little bit about, you know, the solutions that you see could be out there in the role of cons the, the consumer and consumer advocacy within that landscape? Yeah, the number's right, Helena, thanks. Um, seven and a half percent or six and a half percent would be the reduction if everything that we currently do, all the commitments and all the new policies were uh, put into place versus business as usual. So we are not on track. Now, um, the question that you ask, what should consumers and consumer right advoc advocacies really do, is a strategically really interesting one because the consumer is sitting at the back end at the uh, downstream uh, of a well-established global uh, system called the plastic industry. So the consumer has all the powers, but none of the levers. And so it's not trivial to decide what it is that consumers really should do. The first thing that they probably shouldn't do is panic. There was a really thought provoking uh, piece from Jan Piotrowski from The Economist four years ago. Um, uh, panic over plastic, which sort of wasn't much discussed at the time. Uh, and I think, um, and there was an argument made that, look, this is a 30, 30 billion externality, uh, whilst there is a 200 billion externalities that come with dead zones, aren't we over investing and over communicating the plastic thing? I think in the meantime, we have learned a lot more. The conversation has moved on and we have learned we shouldn't panic, but we should worry. Um, uh, A, because um, uh, this is a huge problem in its own right. The, prob uh, the report, Helena, that you kindly pointed at, um, tried to pull in pull together all the numbers available globally. And uh, it essentially says that by 2040, production will double, uh, the influx into the ocean will triple, and the amount of plastic that sits in the ocean will quadruple. Now, and also, and more deeply and slightly more philosoph philosophically, sort of plastic is probably the best evidence we have how much we have generally departed from the very design principles of nature. If we don't get this very iconic piece called plastic right, then we might not get many other things right as we try to uh, to fix our environmental problems. So rather than, but sort of, then we need to move from worry to act. And that was what the report very much was about. And essentially it says said that uh, we can solve it. Uh, there is uh, sort of, we can, um, uh, without major economic or social distortions, uh, which we of course can uh, accept, but that's a political question and we want to sort of to do it analytically. There is a way actually to get uh, uh, rid of 82% of what currently is environmental leakage by 2040. And um, in a way that's better for government, 11% cheaper, that's better for corporates, 13% cheaper to get their products wrapped. Uh, that's better for the climate, 25% better. Uh, that is better for jobs, 6 million more. 
And uh, most importantly, that is just as good for the consumers. And that's an important message because sort of it's not about sort of if this is true, then it's not about sort of going without what you want as a consumer. It's just with going about it in different ways. And that's what the uh, analysis essentially said. It said you would, uh, 30% of what in a business as usual scenario will be additional single use plastic and which then turns into waste um, can be um, uh, actually be reduced, eliminate new delivery models um, and reuse um, uh, everything, uh, Jennifer, that you just talked about, uh, dispensers or just packaging less uh, uh, products in the first place. Another 20% can be substituted. Yes, sort of paper, coated paper, uh, biodegradables. They are have their own problems, uh, but there is a certain segment of uh, packaging and um, single-use plastic that actually can be substituted. And then another 20% can be turned into linear systems recycled. So it has a role, both mechanical and chemical, but it's not a silver bullet. And then only there's then some 20% left where within the current technological and economic frame, there is no good answer of how we get rid of that. But that already takes us um, towards 80%. And the in the important message here, this is sort of the, this, um, uh, the consumer sort of back to today is being delivered uh, what the, the same utility that otherwise single use plastic would deliver. So in other words, it's a good message for the consumer. We just have it to, to do in ways dematerialized, in ways non-plastic or in ways non-linear plastic. That could actually take us there. Though, what is it that the consumer, so sort of back to the heart of your question, can actually do with that? As a consumer yourself, she can only sort of be smarter in the shop uh, by going for these R's uh, that are part of the analysis uh, and by being smart as they vote uh, uh, to make sure that we are pushing for the right frameworks. And within those frameworks, then industry has level playing field opportunities actually to, uh, to solve this problem from source. Uh, if there are modulated EPR systems, um, if there are uh, uh, is, if there's just a phase out of some uh, problematic material such as PVC, which still is, makes up 2% of uh, the packaging, believe it or not, such as the um, uh, recycled content uh, commitments that you need to, or sort of a quota that you need to have in your products, um, such as some uh, mechanisms that actually level the playing field between virgin, which sort of for some time has been getting cheaper and almost killing a fair share of the recycling economy last year, rather than getting uh, 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 more attractive. So all of that actually can be done by smart pl plastics policies. And then around the world, we are uh, learning, the World Bank is working on that, others uh, sort of what smart policy actually looks like. In the same way, we have learned what smart energy policy looks like. It needs to become more of a toolkit and less like al alchemy as it has been uh, part in the part of the past. So that's what consumers actually will have to help uh, pushing from apart from their um, from their uh, own behavior, but they shouldn't, and perhaps that's the most important message from the report, they should it be do not being worried that they're left without what they actually need for, uh, for a good life. Thank you, Martin. And can I go back? I mean, Jennifer, you pointed to businesses keeping their commitments and also an underlying question about what you call the unsustainable socioeconomic system. I'd love it. Could you pick up on that and just sort of comment on the ideas that Martin's put forward and guess sort of how do we put this together? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, I think the the way that we are thinking about it and seeing it is that it, it needs to be seen much more broadly across the entire economic system. Because I think the way that our economic system works right now is that it's about it's about fast. It's about um, fast fashion, it's about purchasing, it's about getting positive feelings by what you buy, it's about marketing, all of those things. And actually, the opportunity, I think, right now is to focus more on well-being. So, um, and getting, and and focusing on getting the, the policies in place so that, yeah, you, you know, maybe this is the comment that maybe Martin and I could debate is, Yes, people can still have a good life. Actually, I think they would have a better life. Um, millions of people would have a better life if you had an economy focused on well-being rather than short-term economic growth. 
but it's likely to be different. It's um, and um, and we we need to make some more fundamental changes that would also then have a benefit on the plastics question, but also on the climate question um, in getting there. We can't just kind of fi fix around the around the edges. And I think I've learned that over the years um, that we need to take that on and work with people to get those solutions. Um, also on things like what you were saying, Martin, kind of the the reuse, the reduce and reuse, and that type of thing, and have a whole different mindset and about how we're how we're engaging as consumers. Martin, so so we don't panic. We stay worried as Elizabeth is. She's rightly worried. Things will be different. Is there any other way that you would paint in sort of ten years' time if we do sort of follow your advice and pick up what what would different look like for you? I mean, it's. Um... <laughs> We, we've, we've all been living through it that uh, social norms can change and the readiness in which we are currently accepting that something that's such a normal part of our highly industrial life is actually uh, unaccounted for the second that we stopped, uh, that we, we, uh, we used it, uh, sort of needs to become inacceptable. And we've all seen, I mean, look, when I started school, um, teachers were allowed to smoke in classroom uh, just imagine yeah you know, in the same way that our kids will be shaking their he heads how, how we have been uh, uh, pouring stone or stone oil into cars to get them moving I think in the same way we need to accept it's just not a very modern sophisticated uh, consumer experience sort of to have a product that you don't know what to do with uh, afterwards that gives you a pang of conscience at the moment that you use it and I think it's we are not it, it's not such a gigantic leap to get to such a world where we are in fact uh, um, creating accountability uh, on all levels um, consumer but then all the way uh, up to the producer so I think this is sort of this one is really I mean uh, there's there's many things to despair about uh, but this the, the, the question of how to use plastic in a more responsible way is so ripe for disruption. Uh, and it's on all levels, A, sort of within this frame that we used for the analysis, Jennifer, where we said, look, even within uh, a framework where we are still using products, yeah, uh, there is a solution out. How much more powerful is that in a world where we are reconsidering some of our uh, fundamental beliefs about well-being and a good life, where we are dematerializing it more broadly? I mean, then it's even easier to get to those numbers, just sort of to uh, reconcile the, uh, uh, your frame and, and the frame that we have been using in the analysis. Perfect. Thank you. So that was um, a fantastic opening to understand a little bit about what possible solutions there are. And actually, I, I like this. So we're, we, there is an opportunity for change, but we need to uh, really meet our commitments. And with that, I'd love to shift to... Um, Will first. Will is, of course, the head of packaging innovation and sustainability at the Body Shop. Um, as you've listened to um, the the description of the problem and the possible solutions, but the the issue of will businesses keep to their commitments? Will they move fast enough? Um, how do we work together um, to really make this shift happen? What are you doing, and um, how do you how do you see consumer advocates? working with you or helping change the system better? So we're, we're currently working on a number of different commitments that we're heading towards. Um, there are commitments that we have publicly announced as part of the wider Natura and Group Co. And we're working with people like Alan MacArthur uh, for the 2025 commitments, but also looking beyond that to generate a set of commitments that make much more sense. Um, so a lot of these are kind of step changes. Uh, but as a company, we have a vision, um, just, just to introduce us a little bit, Body Shop is part of the Natura and Group uh, operation, which is the world's largest B Corp. Um, one of the world's largest beauty companies, but the world's largest B Corp. So we've been co committed to this kind of work for some time. Um, and we're looking at a lot of the targets that, that people are, are committing to, very valid ones about 100% you know, recycling and all this kind of stuff. And starting to think about how we can think bigger than that as well. So the conversation we had earlier, Helena, about um, meeting things like recycling targets is a, is a different point. Um, but we're also thinking about what could be next. Where do we want to be in 2030? Is recycling enough? Well, no, absolutely. So we're starting to put together what it could mean to not just be a zero impact sustainable company, 
but one that makes a positive impact. How can we design products that actively improve the world each time that they are consumed and used? Now, to Jennifer's point earlier, uh, there's a very valid question about the, the push towards uh, consumer consumption being the route towards happiness. And I, I, I'm not disagreeing with what you say whatsoever, um, but we do have a global economy based on production of things to a large extent. So that's not going to go away overnight. And people do, do want things to some extent, whether they need as many things as they get is a, is a different question, but they still want things. So, so, so we're interested in, in trying to work out what, as a company, how we can produce products from end to end, from the supply chain of, of, of you know, flowering plants in, in, in the Amazon through towards packaging, distribution, manufacturing, and you know, all these kinds of things that could result in a net positive impact for the planet. Um, I can't tell you what those commitments are yet because we just don't know what they are. There are metrics quite on, on the, this, this um, type of thing that really gives us the, the, the measures that we want to. There's a company, there's all the interim targets, which people will be very familiar with, of, of uh, recycle, reuse, all these kinds of elements. Um, and actually, in, in the short term, I'll be focusing quite a lot on them because within the next five years, we need a, a business that works and we need to get to that point. But we also have a, a parallel stream of thinking beyond that of, OK, if we just meet those targets, is that where we want to be? And the answer is no. We want to be bigger than that and, and higher than that. So it, it, it's kind of blue sky thinking right now, but we're trying to put together some, some, some thoughts about what a, what a beauty company especially could be. Food is a slightly different question because it is truly essential. Beauty is essential to many people, but not quite as essential as food, I would suggest. Um, and we're trying to work out what a, a company that manufactures things could be in, in the state of the planet and how we could be a positive impact for change. Well, maybe it would be great on this call to hear a couple of ideas from other panelists on what that next generation of commitments could be and how to keep to them. Um, but I'd love to come to Niall at this point. Now, rather than joining a, a you've been a sustainability expert for many years, um, you've been part of larger organizations and you've re more recently set up your own organization in response to tackling plastic pollution. Can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to head in that route, what you're doing, and your perspective on how do consumers fit into tackling plastic pollution? Thanks, Alina. <clears throat> Great to be uh, amongst you all. Um, just on the, um, the, the life choice that I faced, I think like many of us, I was really touched by uh, David Attenborough's uh, Blue Planet episode back in October 2017 and it um, for somebody who spent their life working in sustainability set up the practice in in, in Accenture um, something similar in, in in Saatchi and then went into uh, British Telecom to be their CSO for seven years but around the time I was trying to figure out what to do next I saw that baby calf um, with a belly full of plastic and and that touched me in a way that um nothing else has and I've seen a lot of stuff as I imagine the rest of you have as well and um, I started looking to see where's the innovation on this on climate I could see cheap solar out of China I could see Tesla I could see quite a few examples that gave hope and actually going back to the approach that Systemic have taken which was was uh, very similar to what McKinsey did on the cost curve abatement methodology back in 2008 um, you could actually size and, and figure out what innovation was needed to get to a um, two degree warming scenario. Um, on plastic, I saw none of that. Um, there was some um, early uh, innovation, but certainly not the type of openness and collaboration and data-driven peer-reviewed approaches that would kind of really give you confidence that we were on top of the issue. And as these things go, synchronicity happens. And I bumped into the founders of, of Polymateria who had you know, brought together a team of polymer scientists, biologists, and chemists. They were similarly concerned about this issue. They realized that there was nothing kind of on the landscape that was you know, scientifically credible and they wanted to, to really kind of break new ground. So um, frankly, I jumped at the opportunity made the decision within, within days. But what, what we quickly realized within the weeks and months ahead was that 
when it comes to understanding this issue, firstly, 32% of all plastic winds up in the natural environment. And when you drill into that number, and this is Jambeck data from four or five years ago, but I'd, I'd imagine if anything, it's worse now. Um, that 31% of those uh, of those of that material flow is polyolefins. And the interesting thing about polyolefins is they're actually quite a pure material, unlike polystyrene and, and PVC, which are very toxic and frankly should just be banned. Polyolefins can be put back in sync with our biological cycle, but until we had come along, no one had figured out how to do that without creating microplastic. And also reflective of what happens out there in, in, in real world conditions. So, so on land, um, um, and that's, that's kind of where, where the problem is biggest, 80% of all um, material flows into the oceans come from land. So if you can solve for polyolefins on the terrestrial environment, um, that they were the parameters we put around um, those first few years of innovation and all the kind of the seed capital kind of went into, into tackling that. But it, it became really obvious that as, as opposed to try to crack the innovation and then go out and tell the world about it, what we actually needed to do to bring confidence, confidence back into the policy arena and, and, and industry was to very early on make the decision to open source part of our IP and to show scientifically how you can take something polymeric and transform that into a grease or a wax and then make that grease or wax attractive to nature and then ensure that in, in a reasonable time frame, a year or two, that you're, you create uh, only carbon dioxide, water and biomass and there's nothing left and also no harm to the natural environment. All this sounds very obvious, but no one had done it before. So we looked at the various different approaches to standards taken in, in, in the States with ASTM and in Europe with CEN, and there was quite clearly a gap. So we started to work through the very collaborative process that, that BSI, the British Standards Institution, were able to put in place to really pull in experts in um, biology and in, in polymer science in, in weathering in, in kind of trying to build an ecosystem of scientific evidence to say what are the pass fail criteria that are is required in each of these uh, instances informed by us sharing uh, you, you know um, peer-reviewed data and evidence that we were uniquely able to provide as a business and really trying to create a new spirit of collaboration on this particular issue uh, to 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 um, have a, a much more rigorous evidence based approach. Now, from a consumer perspective, this is incredibly important because um, you have to be able to substantiate your claims. So the ISO fourteen zero twenty one um, uh, green marketing guidelines. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with them. Um, but you you have you cannot make wild outlandish claims about biodegradability or, or or even recycling now. You have to actually say within what conditions, within what time frame. So there's absolute clarity for the consumer, but you need that bedrock of science to be able to substantiate and back it off in the right conditions, and that 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 didn't exist. So we we launched that uh, with BSI back in, in September. And have then quickly turned our attention to the next beachhead for not just us, but any innovator in this space, which is one of the unique features of our technology is, is, is timing it. So giving, giving a kind of a, a, a time frame within which you can use the materials. Ideally, you reuse those materials as well. And for whatever end of life scenario is possible. And, and Jennifer mentioned that... Um, you know, recycling is 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 a fallacy. I'd 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 say it's it's aspirational. We kind of need to design to give that every chance to happen. And the best way to do that with a technology like ours is not to think about just biodegradation on its own or just recycling on its own, but to design for both of those things together. Which was the initial vision for the circular economy. You know that Bill McDonough articulated in Cradle to Cradle was the biological cycle is our first design principle but we need to design for the technical cycle, the human made recycling system, give it every chance, but acknowledge that when things wind back up in nature, they should cause no harm, which is the real problem with plastic. So um, all of that has, has um, led us to this unique point in our, in, our, in our journey where the timing that we give to consumers to act responsibly 
is now incredibly important because whilst biodegradation might confuse them, being able to make a substantiated claim to them that says you have either a disposed by date or a recycled by date that can be the, an exact month or the point in the future within which you have to act responsibly, Everything we're seeing from a lot of neuroscience and behavioral work on Gen Z and Gen Y, if you get that right, if you deploy kind of ethical nudge principles in a way that is authentic and transparent and really draws them in, they will be your most powerful champions and they will drive your technology forward better than anything else. And you can see some examples of it from maybe some of the disruptive plant-based alternatives. So some of the protein um, uh, alternatives like Impossible would be an example, uh, and in the oat-based dairy alternatives, Oatly is another example. Regardless of what you think of those innovations and how pure you think they are, you have to look at what they're doing in the consumer space to say there's certainly something in that in terms of how they're connect connecting with Gen Z and Gen Y. So that's very much the next beachhead. I don't think just for us as a business, um, but for everybody who's innovating in this space and trying to put forward credible solutions um, and I'd really like to kind of hear you know guidance and, and thoughts from panel and and uh, and um, uh, other attendees on, on how to do that and, and get that right. Thank you and I think this is fascinating because we've got a larger established business saying what are the commitments we make and how do we fit in the, in this and how fast can we change the the process of all the, the, the cycle of consumption and production. We've got an innovator who's saying, how do I create the playing field and the pull for a different way of doing things? Um, so I'm gonna come back to the consumer advocates to see if we can answer this. This is where um, I'm going to come to Anya and Saroja for their perspective. Now, Anya, of course, is the president of the, the Danish Consumer Council. Saroja uh, heads the uh, civic action and consumer group in Chennai in India. And both of them are on our board and council. Um, so we can have a good conversation afterwards here. So I'd love, Anya, first, if you could talk to us a little bit about, let's start with tackling plastic pollution. How do, um, how do you see this? Um, how do consumers perceive this in Europe? How are you as a consumer advocate taking this on board and what's your reaction to what you've heard from uh the experts on the, and businesses on this call thank you to be here oh well there have been said so many interesting things and uh, i somehow i will kind of draw back to the more practical side from consumers perspective in uh, what you have already said but i think there's uh, one point that actually helena make without maybe knowing it in, in her introduction of the whole discussion. And Neil also said something about it. Um, that was a motivation for acting. And um, Helena mentioned Rosemary, who was on our board. Um, and what made us choose this uh, subject for being the whole theme for Consumer Rights Day this year. And that was this picture from her local beach. And I still remember it very clear. And what happened there is that she brought to life the cold fact of those eight to 10 million tons we throw into the oceans each year, looking at her local beach. It was so disgusting. And it was one big dump for the whole waste from our region. Um, she died from Corona. Uh, this January, it's still really hard to understand. And she should have been here today. But I think this is a clear message of um, what motivates us to act and how interlinked we all are staying on the same earth. And that is really this motivation to act. It could be Edinburgh's movie, or it could be the picture from Rosemary that make us uh, really start thinking, innovating, and all of these beautiful ideas all of you have, have mentioned. And um, I think in you ask for the situation in uh, the European region, and I think that this uh, issue of plastic pollution actually experience very severe public awareness. Um, and the need of action in my part of the world is widely supported on most levels in society, which is the good story, the good news. 
And um, if we look at the structural changes, I can tell you that all the Nordic countries at least has have some form of uh, national legislation in place. And uh, many of our countries are applicable to EU waste legislation, which is uh, one of the things that Jennifer also mentioned. Uh, we need this law to be in place. So the positive story is also that uh, in July 21st, we will have a new EU legislation in place. We call it the single use plastic directive. And that will really prohibit or place new restrictions on a range of disposable plastic uh, items. For example, banning the straws and the balloons and those things. And uh, it's actually quite ambitious, um, the objectives of this legislation. And, um, and one thing that will come in place is also that member states, they have to collect 90% of all bottles in uh, 29. And I will actually turn back uh, with, to this example in a little while. But the good story here is that the green movement has been growing in Northern Europe. And in my country, we for the first time in our history actually had a green election, uh, meaning that um, the environment and the climate issues that was top priority in 19 for the voters and resulted in a, a vote with clear demands for uh, solutions. And you have touched upon it, um, but in Denmark, the circular economy is seen as a very clear answer to uh, part of the challenge, but of course not stands alone as, as Jennifer also said. Well, what can we do as a consumer advocate? Um, well, we can help uh, these engaged voters and consumers to demand products and also um, to make the good choice. And uh, what we are doing in, in Denmark is that we test products so we can actually guide very concrete products. We can guide consumers to stay clear of those products. For example, uh, having um, harmful chemicals in it or uh, containing microplastics. And we see actually a growing demand from the Danish consumers they want to stay clear of these products, but we need, as uh, also Elizabeth said, we need to inform them and we need to provide them with the right tools. Um, so I would say we, we have a, a big support, but the structure needs to be in place. The challenge I think we are facing here in my part of the region is to getting these uh, recycling systems in place locally and also to integrate the large scale uh, schemes, um, incorporating into this circular uh, economy model. So we get some value into the chain. And here's a, a more negative number. We only um, recycle 35% of our plastic waste in Denmark. And that highlights the necessity for the, um, the advocacy and the lobbying for getting solutions. And uh, we had a heavy lobbying for, for that in Denmark, at least in um, 2018, we then got the government to launch a national action plan on the plastic pollution. So they allocated money and 27 initiatives to find solutions. And um, the core purpose of this national action plan is to um, look at the entire value chain, get all levels to cooperate together. So we're not sitting on each other, an island and also to work on all the levels of, of our problem. That means less plastic in nature, as you have talked about, smarter design, as we have heard, smarter production and construction and consumption, better waste management, a big issue and also building the knowledge base on this. Um, and of course, securing uh, re reuse and recycling. So I want to mention one practical example here. Um, we have a very um, great uh, and well-established deposit and return system for bottles and it came by law. So today in Denmark, uh, actually very much in front of the EU regulation, nine out of 10 bottles no matter what they're made of, tin, cans, a plastic, glass, 
it can be recycled, returned and recycled where the consumers normally do their shopping. And um, that actually uh, eliminates 150,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, what we are actually recycling this way. So um, I would say 95% of the consumers actually support the, this deposit and return system. And that really illustrates to answer your question, Helena, that this engagement and involvement of consumers really highly contributes to the success of uh, reducing plastic waste. So the last example I will give is that this pressure that has come from the green organization, from the consumer organization and so on, has led to legislation um, that will force all Danes to sort their trash in 10 fractions this summer. And that includes also hard and soft plastic. So, and we can see that uh, a lot of people, uh, actually seven out of 10 support this and want to sort even more. So that's in place, but we need the back end structure around it to be in place. And we need it to make it really easy. We need to get those harmful chemicals out of the plastic productions. If not, we can't recycle it. So, and of course, prohibit this massive consumption of uh, single use plastic. Do you think, I mean, as we listened to Jennifer, she said, you know, we have to be cautious about recycling and pushing just recycling as a solution. Mm -hmm. Martin was very hopeful and feel, feels that this is a, a, a possible change for us. Do you think from a European standpoint, um, you see that, that shift in consumer behavior and mindset happening? Absolutely. And also, whenever the innovation brings up products that um, has found new ways of producing packaging material and other things, people are very quick uh, running to get it. They ask for it. So, but it needs to be there and uh, we need the choice and informed choice, choice around it. And it needs to be easy, but they want, they want it. Perfect. Thank you. Saroja, how would you answer that question? Where do you see this, uh, the, the consumer behavior and consumer choice heading? Hi, Helena. So uh, as first I would say that as consumer advocates, we advocate for a zero waste policy. So that is our uh, aim, objective actually. So try to reduce generating waste, segregate waste at source, use biodegradable waste to actually um, uh, convert it into manure for your roof garden and only the uh, degradable uh, like uh, non-biodegradable waste you reduce generating that waste that is the lesson that we take to consumers and we try to uh, educate them on reducing and reuse basically and only the recycling comes as a last option and we don't support incineration also. So that is uh, our take on this. And uh, having said this, I think I should uh, tell you, so consumers in India, basically, I should say there is some growing awareness among consumers, especially in the urban setup. Like, yes, they do understand that plastic, um, the, uh, the issues around plastic pollution, the harmful effects of uh, plastic waste, the awareness is growing. But then there is a, a very long way to go. But for several decades now, we are all, the whole entire uh, globe is actually drowned in plastics. So it's going to take a while. We are really uh, a, a tough uh, uh, fight, I think, against this uh, plastic pollution. Uh, we'll have to go on for the next uh, few um, uh, years at least. And uh, as far as India goes, like there's all, um, uh, while there is awareness, uh, building awareness amongst consumers, the problem is like there are some uh, certain laws like uh, in India, like there is a ban on single use plastics in several states and uh, extended producer responsibility rules are there. We have the plastic waste management rules. Several of these are there, but then there's no adequate awareness about these amongst consumers. Like India's response to plastic pollution consumers don't know, which means that there's a gap between the government's actions and consumer awareness. So that uh, there needs to be more information from the government side to the consumers on the efforts taken and what kind of uh, laws are in place, what kind of 
why plastic pollution is an issue this kind of uh, uh, information dissemination should and implementation of plastic bans and all should uh, uh, from the government side uh, is uh, is actually needed and also like if you see if consumers say that they don't want to use single use plastics what are the alternatives available, available to consumers this is another issue that consumers face they are not readily available is one and if it's available it's expensive so are they able to afford it this is another issue uh, as far as consumers go and a recent study done in india shows that around um, 8 out of 10 consumers feel that online platforms use excessive packaging and need to be regulated so uh, there are um, uh, like um, platforms like amazon and flipkart have start, uh, taken steps to reduce but then there is a long way to go there are more several more actions required from their end and um, so if we have to look at actions that are needed for progress uh, i think uh, we all agree that this is a very big menace plastic uh, men plastic based menace so all stakeholders have to play a major role and uh, of course individuals as single consumers they need to be aware they need to reduce use of plastics reuse all these definitely they have to do but then the businesses the corporations and the government also also have a major role to play and uh, so businesses should innovate as the earlier speakers have been saying like i think businesses should rethink and redesign uh the um, uh, come up with alternatives to plastics and if in case till then at least or in case they have to use plastics then that is where they have to make sure that it's recyclable and the information should be clearly provided on the labels about the recycling possibility and so that the consumer can understand and make informed choices so that is one uh, thing that is needed much needed here and uh, for countries like uh, india uh, developing countries um, we have uh, limit uh, as far as enforcement goes there are limitations and so a blanket ban is needed i will not say no but then that alone cannot be a possible solution so the a, com a combination of strategies may be required to uh, uh, required for example uh, creating an incentive based system for the consumer and the retailer so that they are Uh, motivated to actually not throw generate plastic waste but then to give it for uh, uh, recycling they they should introduce buyback schemes incentive schemes like deposit return schemes or something to encourage consumers to hand over the plastic waste like wherever there uh, there is no innovation and like uh, if they have not come up with alternatives at least until then this will help at least it um, uh, to make sure that plastic waste is reduced the generation of plastic waste is reduced actually and um, uh, also uh, alternatives should be readily available and at affordable cost this is also very important so government should frame policies to satisfy this need of consumers and this is very important to tackle plastic pollution and uh, we have the epr but then <clears throat> it is almost 5 years i think since it was introduced and, uh, and so that needs to be strengthened and implementation needs to be effective so that uh, we are able to because uh, pl plastic pollution is a wicked problem and uh, it's posing a challenge that seems to surpass our ability to tackle it basically so we need the combined collective and interacting effort of all producers citizens policy makers and government government system government systems so that uh, we are able to deal with this we are able to it looks like we are not we will not be able to surpass but then definitely we will be able to do it see india has traditionally been a very very uh, sustainable uh, we have been uh, 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 practicing sustainable consumption for several years uh, still a few decades back only recently like with the influence of other uh, 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 other for influence from other countries like i think we have actually gone into this plastic we are also drowned in plastic i think it's going it's only a matter of time if all action if all efforts are put in i'm sure we will be able to actually deal with this effectively so thank you very much
Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I think we um, we have time to come to some questions so that people can get ready with their questions and panelists might have questions for each other even. Um, you can write in your question or raise your hand in the panelist um, uh, list and we can call on you. But to give people time to think about that, I'm actually going to come back to Elizabeth. You started out with two things. You, you said it's not just plastics, actually. You said it's sustainable consumption and it's really worrying us. Um, you, you talked about we, need to, we, we actually need to change the way in which we, we manage our system. You've heard from a range of experts here. Um, what's your reflection on that? Are you feeling more or less worried? And have you heard ideas that make you think, ah, yes, people are working on some real solutions? Um, and what might actually, I mean, you've had a great invitation from Will, um, one of the, a big multinational company. What would you like him to put in his commitments as he thinks about them? Elizabeth. Thanks, Alenia. Uh, well, I think it's a big issue. So I would like to talk about many things around sustainable consumption and plastic pollution. But uh, I would like to say in the first place that, for example, uh, when we talk about young and young people, we, we think that all of them have the same characteristic, but we have to, to, to look at the global. There are many types of young, young population. There are young like me, for example, that I read a lot about sustainable consumption, about plastic pollution. So i a little bit more aware about the, the issue. So I try to do in my life, in my daily life, uh, some habits because I'm conscious about the impact that I have in the world. But it's difficult, for example, uh, in this meeting I was talking, but I received a message for a company that I don't know how they have my number. And they say, you, you have a promotion. Uh, this is a sale for one day to have, you have 24 hours to buy this item. So, okay, <laughs> I don't know how they have my numbers, but all the days I receive messages. So that is a common practice in, in Peru, in Chile, in Argentina, in Latin America, and I know that in many countries. So that is a problem because you try, but the environment is like a, they have another plan for you. So uh, I, I listened for some of, especially that they talked about the uh, economic system. And that is, I, I think that one of the problem part uh, from there. Why? Because for example, since you're in university, uh, you receive the message of many industries that come to university and talks about how it's important to, uh, the, how, why it's important the manufacturer, why is the importance of the marketing. And they, they are not aware about the impact in the, in the environment. And when I talk, when I have the opportunity to talk with company, they only uh, see plastic pollution like recycle a bottle. And I would like to make emphasis in here because they only think that pollution, uh, plastic pollution or uh, sustainable consumption only is about recycling. Uh, and that's in play, no, nothing else. So I, I, I know that it's a, a really impact in recycling. I know that it's important, but I also know that it's not only that. So I think it's really important for, for many companies to work with consumers to, to make uh, a new system and, and that person, and, and that implies social norms. We have to re-engineer, uh, re-imagine, rethink how to communicate and how the companies communicate, uh, not only for the consumers, also in all, in all the system. So I think that that's really important. Uh, another thing that I would like uh, to talk, it's uh, one of the commitment that I would like uh, for companies, uh, it's the, um, they don't see the world like uh, you have to buy. They, I think that companies just see consumers that we are the person that gonna buy something. I will, or, or they try, or they think that, that our life is only to be happy with them. And the definition of happy is just buy, is just uh, uh, try to see a marketing, a good advertising. I, I would like to listen for a company that told me about that they are really aware for the for the environment and not only imply recycle. 
in Peru, for example, people who recycle is only the three percent, three percent. So it means that three three persons in in a hundred of persons just recycle, and that happens because social norms, because the speaking of companies, because the economic system. So I think it's a structural problems, and I would like that this is that um, company don't just don't just see um, pol uh, plastic pollution like a social responsibility in order to just attract more consumers, if not because they really want to be part of the solution. So that is my reflection. <laughs> Oh, nice challenge there, Will, Niall. I'm going to have to ask you about this. It's not just about what you're doing in your bit of the company. It's everything that happens across, you know, communications and the way in which the company cares about, truly cares about consumers and about their lives. How are you going to fit that into your commitment and how are you going to respond and reassure Elizabeth? Will, do you want to go first? Happy to go on that, actually. Um, well, I, I, I agree with you entirely. It's, it's, it's what, we, what we're trying to do throughout the business, as I say, from everything from transportation to production. But the consumer engagement is a really interesting point. Um, and actually, last week, I had a call with our consumer um, training team who, who train the people in our shops globally regarding things like sustainability of packaging so we've just launched a, a, a new pack on one of our products um, getting rid of some of the black plastic that was in there that was hard to to recycle and turning it into into pet and, and aluminium packaging and so i had a, a call with these people to to who train the people in the shops to have an intelligent conversation with consumers um, and and actually convey some some of the slightly more complicated information than the simple headlines that we read in in, in newspapers um, it's a it's a very complex subject. You know the, the contrasting views here about you know, recycling versus you know eventual compost and degradation type things and so forth. I've, I've been working in it twenty years. I've got a PhD in material science and and you know, I learn new things every day in in the whole area. So it's a complex read, um, set, set of questions. And I think how we communicate that out to consumers is really important. Um, we're lucky in my particular company that we're also a retailer. So we have direct access to, to, to consumers. Um, but in previous roles where I've worked in where the company doesn't have that direct access, it's actually very challenging. One of the reasons being that um, a lot of consumers, if they hear messages from the, the uh, big, big producers of the, of the world, um, they will automatically think that there's um, a certain level of subterfuge going on um, in that, you know, it, it, whatever a large company says if you're a large polluter no one believes that you're actually trying to get better and actually i haven't been on the inside of a lot of these companies there are commercial pressures and so forth that mean that not every choice is the perfect one but generally there is a drive to to, to get better in many ways um, and how those co uh, companies communicate is quite challenging um, we often need to do it therefore via groups like this via ngos and so forth you, know, you kind of have to have the trusted part that the people will believe because even though you're trying to tell the truth People don't necessarily believe you. So it's, it's a really hard thing to, to get across when a company really is trying. We're doing what we can to, to, to get better. Um, but you're not necessarily seen as, 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 as being genuine in that, in that desire when often there is a genuine desire to be in the right place. And maybe who, who is verifying you and who is sort of looking at what you're doing and actually providing the, the fact base to show that you're moving in the right direction? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Because there's so much... Um, uh, there's, there's so many short-term solutions out there that, that people can put in place. I, I, I won't use the word greenwashing because often it's, it's through a lack of knowledge as much as anything else. Um, I had a talk from, from the, the CEO of Abel & Cole, the um, vegetable delivery s system in the UK a little while ago, who was talking about using uh, oxy-degradable plastics, which now all know very, very well indeed. Um, and yes, yeah, so it was 10, 15 years ago, he heard about oxy-degradable plastics for the plastic bags they were using, thought that sounds brilliant. They bought 60,000 of these plastic bags. Someone told him a week later that these were actually terrible for the environment and they ended up getting landfilled because he, he felt he couldn't use them anymore. He'd been sold a, a, a kind of you know, magic solution. So, so you know, seeing these magic solutions in, in the role I'm doing, I, we have people coming to us all the time with great solutions that will solve all the problems and the ability to filter these kinds of questions. And, and as you say, there isn't an overarching, there are standards for certain things like biodegradability, but there aren't standards for overall good. And that's where we're trying to get. And it's a, it's a pretty challenging set of competing needs at any one time. 
Perfect. And Niall, briefly, as you start out your company and you talked about having to try and build the standards and sort of look at how standards are set to enable you to, to introduce new products, listening to Elizabeth, how are you going, how are you planning to create that sort of different relationship with consumers so they maintain trust in what you're doing? Yeah, trust is the key word and everything actually moves at the speed of trust. So just, just to Will's point, the reason we had to create standards was because of all of those issues that you, you kind of spoke about, where, where frankly, people were able to get away with it because um, there was no scrutiny, there was no, there was no challenge. And it was quite easy to just load up plastic with salt and tell people it was going to biodegrade because it fragmented but there was no real science there was no real innovation it was just we'll use the word greenwash that's exactly what it was um and that's a that's created huge headwinds for new innovators to actually overcome is the lack of scientific rigor and integrity and also the misinformation because the incumbent system our specialists are creating misinformation around new innovations coming through and trying to tarnish scientific efforts and, 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 and credibility. And we have to step back from all of that and not necessarily fight them at their own game. But equally, um, if we try to fight this battle with sticks and stones, we're going to lose. And by we, I mean all of us here today who are actually trying to make a difference. My view is that we are in the hyper-consumption age and that hyper-consumption has been driven by digitization of the consumer experience and misinformation goes hand in hand with that at the moment. And unless we use those very same tools and approaches, choice engines, big data, algorithms, but with a level of ethics and transparency that, that frankly has been missing to date and do it in a way where we co-create the solutions together with the consumer, where they are the, the, um, the, 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 and there's quite a few examples of successful business models where when you give control over to the consumer and you ask them to design the product, Nike ID is the one example that I'd, I'd, I'd kind of point to where there was huge ego in Nike around, we know how to design our sneakers better than anyone. Why would we give that control to the consumer? But as soon as they did give the control to the consumer, it was one of the most successful um, revenue lines within all, all of um, the whole the whole Nike empire. Now that same principle on something like this, but taking maybe what Amazon tried to do recently with a lot of the um, labels and linking the um, everything from cradle to cradle through to uh, Rainforest Alliance and a lot of the labeling that is out there at the moment, but connecting that with the consumer's values is a start and it's great to see those types of platforms taking this on at scale because frankly we're not going to fight this era of hyper consumption with sticks and stones we have to use those types of innovative tools um, um, in, in order to 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 flip from con from conspicuous consumption to more conscientious more collaborative consumption and in the process kind of flip this mis misinformation age into an information age. And the key to that is making the consumer and their values central to everything that we're doing. Thank you. Now we're getting a couple of great questions and comments in, in the chat. Um, the, from Korea, um, a comment about con Korean consumers are really good at recycling. They've been separating recyclable goods from non-recyclable trash for several years, but then it turns out that most of the plastic is actually not recyclable only clear plastic and other types of plastic. We don't know whether this is economic or for scientific reasons, and it's really frustrating. Um, another comment, waste segregation is done by many citizens at their ends, but efforts go down the drain because the waste collection done by the authorities puts it in one big collection bin, ultimately mixing all the waste. And Amritalal Saha has pointed, put in the question, you know, can we influence that system? Can we influence then the global bodies to have a policy to gradually stop plastic pollution. Any action has been done so far in this regards. So I'd love to come to Jennifer and Martin and actually Anya as well to talk a bit about, you know, so consumers do their job, they do more of it, um, but the system falls down. Talk a little bit about that, but then at the global level, what's happening and can consumer advocacy give any constructive uh, assistance in that regard? Can I come to Jennifer first? 
Sure, great, great questions. And I share the frustration for sure. I mean, I think people think they're doing the right thing. Um, I'm sitting in Germany and Germans are also very good recyclers, um, but then they find that actually things aren't being, uh, there are things I had no idea that they were being shipped across the, off across the seas, um, which has a whole nother set of environmental problems to it. So I think, um, I think we need to be working on all levels. Um, and I think I, you know, I agree that we, we need to be um, engaging with the same level of tools um, as you, know, you were saying um, and uh, in, in, in this engagement. But I, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, whether it be at the local level, so if you're in a city or a town and you, you um, it makes a difference in, in my experience, if you, depends where you are, but if you actually are engaging in trying to get those systems set up. Um, but I maybe, I think it would be good to, to think also a, just a slightly different, like a mindset shift of if you're a person, yes, okay, recycle, but actually think about um, using your funds in different ways. So for example, uh, if you're going to a night market, instead of buying things and uh, in kind of containers when you're at the night market, I, I had the pleasure of sitting next to a Greenpeace volunteer in Taiwan a few years ago, and she was part of a 20,000 person youth plastic free life life network right and so she she was doing things like um, just fundamentally using her own uh, containers and also going to whether it be supermarkets or other places to actually demand refilling um, uh, possibilities so different business models all together um, and maybe will that's something I'm sure you're thinking about of like how do you actually do, um, a, much more of a reuse um, than, than just a, a recycled piece of it. So I think one thing would be to, as a consumer, to choose, you know, something that you care about and uh, engage with the decision makers, either in that company or on the local level, to actually come up with different business models of how to do this and to engage your friends in creating much more social norms. Because if you think about it, I think how fast we can create new cultural and social norms is also incredibly important. So I know in many places, if you, well, certainly in Greenpeace, but I think overall, if you go into a meeting with a plastic bag um, or a plastic cup or, you know, a coffee coffee thing with a plastic container, it might not have that great of a, of a feeling. Those are social norms that have, have built. So I think that's another thing that consumers can be doing with your own uh, kind of behaviors that are there. I think um, maybe just to jump to the the global level. I mean, there are um, that you know, plastics is that there's different <laughs> places that this lands, but it doesn't land really anywhere just specifically. I mean, and I think that makes it challenging. I think a lot of the engagement needs to be at the national level. Um, I think Anya's comments uh, about kind of what's been happening in Denmark and in the European Union, and that's you know also other countries that are actually either banning or creating uh, slow circular economy models. Um, also where you're, you're actually trying to slow down um, the, you know, the uptake of new versions of uh, smartphones, for example, can can be coming in. So I would engage more on the national level. On the international level, I think uh, if you care about oceans, then you need to care and plastic and oceans. Then there's an international negotiation going on right now um, on the high seas. Believe it or not, the vast majority of our oceans and seas are not covered in any kind of any governance. And there's a very important negotiation now to try and get at least 30% of all um, oceans and land actually at least um, uh, protected by 2030. So that's a place to engage because it's just another level where there can be that kind of accountability on the national level for com countries that engage there. Let me stop there. Um, lots, lots to say. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Martin. I've spent quite some time in Muncha. That's in East Java. Uh, we have a project there. It's called Stop that we run together with our partners. And uh, we spent lots of time with the villagers and I keep being struck by the cleanliness of their households uh, and uh, that the sense of beauty that they're cultivating in their village 
uh, and still uh, they um, <clears throat> they throw the rubbish in the river, uh, not because they don't have a culture of cleanliness uh, or wouldn't have a culture of cleanliness, uh, but simply because there's no recovery system. It's the only, there, there's no way out, um, and that sort of also speaks to the message that what is it that consumers can do if the system isn't set up for it. The more agitating it is that or double agitating it is if people in Korea, the Netherlands and Germany who have actually already separated their waste see it going up in the air. Um, and it's uh, agitating a because there's so much consumer goodwill that's lost and that's dearly needed. Uh, and secondly, because it's so avoidable, because there is policy instruments available, such as modulated fee EPRs, if you have something that is recycled, then uh, actually you don't have to pay high EPR fees. Uh, if it's something that's recyclable, then they are higher but still low. And if it's something that's not recyclable, uh, back to the Korean question, uh, then you just pay a lot. And so all of a sudden you will start finding out that there's less and less of the non-recyclables actually coming through. Um, and there's also then going to be more and more willis, willingness to disclose. And I think that's a very Im important one. Will, you were there a moment ago. So the, um, uh, we, we need to make sure that consumers, investors, any kind of stakeholders actually know what's your plastic performance. And we are completely confused. Well, at least I am sort of, I don't really sort of, even my family laughs at me um, at every shopping experience, even be, having read up on this uh, particular subject, I still find it very hard to be a responsible consumer. Um, but we have to recognize that um, whilst of course it's complicated, there are a couple of things that we, are able to say on a company on a product level, A, is this decoupled from virgin oil and gas? You can measure it and you can put it onto a, a product. Uh, secondly, uh, how much of this is likely to end up in the environment? And thirdly, what is, is it uh, worth post-use? So um, decouple, delete, de and revalue. And this, this is something that you couldn't put in easy parameters and that is making um, shopping or any consumer choice much easier. And I guess there's almost a double motivation to do that, a must double, uh, uh, motivation and a can motivation, a can motivation in, because in climate and carbon, we start learning it. Uh, and of course, uh, why it's climate change is um, hugely complex. Uh, it's a bit easier than the plastic thing because it's a homogeneous uh, emittent. Uh, but here we learn what it actually takes to make carbon visible across the whole value chain uh, so that you have make, make better choices as a consumer, as a financial investor, etc. And the, uh, and, the, and the must motivation is if we don't get this right in plastic, how on earth will we ever get it right on uh, food or things that are related to uh, uh, the living world, where also we need to be able to introduce information in the future that makes us responsible consumers. And these are sort of much more complex systems than the plastic world that we created. And even here, there's no way around putting information into products. Um, and so again, I think, uh, if we don't get it right for plastic, how on earth are we going to solve other, uh, other challenges? And finally, I think Anya, you wanted to respond also to the question from India about how consumer advocacy gets involved in the international stage. Yeah, uh, because uh, Jennifer and Martin just said a lot of what I also wanted to say, so I will leave that. But um, uh, in 2022, there will be the UN Environmental Programme Assembly. And the Danish government has promised there to work for a global strategy and agreement on, on plastic waste. So I think that's really where all our advocacy uh, forces could go together and try to support them from all the countries that we represent. Uh, at least we know we have the, they have promised us, promised us to do that. So maybe you would support it. Absolutely. So we're coming to the close of this um, fantastic opportunity to learn more. Um, what we've heard is this is an urgent issue which keeps our, you know, the next generation up at night and keeps us up at night. And even if we shouldn't panic about it, we're worried. But uh, this is a problem which we can attack. And actually, if we can't attack this one, then, you know, this is a good one to practice with. Consumers can do something. We've laid out the seven R's, and it's not just about the R that's recycling. It's a broader set of R's, which includes refusing, 
rethinking, uh, repairing. And I encourage us all to look at those and to, to sort of know more about the problem. And then during the course of this conversation, I hope you'll uh, agree with me. I think a fantastic opportunity to learn about how businesses are thinking about this, how they're trying to work with standards that don't fit uh, that don't, don't fit the problem, how they're thinking about their commitments and communicating those commitments and developing a new conversation, um, how we need to be advocating to government because all of this you know, needs to be supported and that both on a national, a regional and international level and in places like the high seas, um, which perhaps that consumer advocacy hasn't gone to date, but that might be where we need to be. Um, I think we also raised, of course, through Elizabeth and through Jennifer most and most um, this question about how does this fit in the broader conversation about sustainable consumption and what that means um, and uh, moving towards a quality future where safety incorporates sustainability for us all. So let me just thank everyone for having joined this conversation today. Um, this is the kickoff and the starting point of uh, moving towards World Consumer Rights Day, which will be March the 15th. We hope you share your consu consumer stories on tackling plastic pollution from around the world during the course of this week. And we hope you take and pick up some of what we've shared with you as members to talk to your government about changes that need to be made, because otherwise we'll be back in that situation that we heard from Korea and India where we're doing everything right and it's not enough. And that's not good. That's not good enough. Okay. Now, um, I would like to sincerely thank our panelists from today, Jennifer, Martin, Anya, Elizabeth, uh, Saroja, Will, Niall, um, you have been absolutely fantastic to bring your perspective on this together and to help us raise uh, consumer advocacy um, together and tackle plastic pollution. Uh, stay safe, stay well, everybody, and let's see how we move forward. Um, we've got one last piece there. Absolutely, of course, on social media, hashtag no plastic pollution on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. What would we do without that in the Zoomiverse? Um, thank you so much for having joined. Speak soon.